All right, so good morning, everybody. Welcome to lecture seven of Mathematical Methods, uh, part one, part two, sorry. And we've been talking about group theory. So in the previous lecture, let's just quickly go over. I uh, reminded you of all the uses of group theory, um, in case you didn't already know that. Then I talked about Schur's lemma, which I will admit I didn't do a very satisfactory job of explaining. But the bottom line of Schur's lemma is the following, that if there are two inequivalent representations, D and D prime G, and if there exists a matrix which uh, takes uh, D into D prime, or D prime into D, and such that this is true for all elements G, then this implies uh, that there are two possibilities that either uh, if these if these two really are in equivalent representations, then the matrix has to be zero. In other words, there is no matrix which can take you between inequivalent representations. And on the other hand, if they are equivalent representations, then this matrix has to be equal to the identity. And so this implies for, it implies very important property of abelian groups. So an abelian group, what is, the abel what is an abelian group? it satisfies this property, right? For all group elements, um, maybe I should. For all elements G1, G2 in the group, and so this is called an abelian group, right? Or a commutative group because these two, the product of these, of any two elements uh, commutes. So for an abelian group, we can take any two elements, let's say G and G prime, and they commute, right? By definition of what is an abelian group. Now fix one element, any one element of the group, G naught, let's say. Then this condition is true by, again, by definition, by the, by the abelian property. But then what, uh, what this is saying is, uh, that uh, you have some representation D of G and you have some matrix D of G naught, right? Such that this condition that is given in Schur's lemma is satisfied, right? And so if this condition is satisfied, uh, then uh, how can we understand this? then we know that uh, D of G naught has to be equal to the identity according to the conditions of Schur's lemma. And what would it mean if this matrix is an identity, if it's proportional to the identity, that means it can only have one degree of freedom, which is some number multiplied by the identity. So, uh, so D of G can be written as a direct sum of uh, N copies, where N is the dimension of this representation as N copies of the one dimensional representation. Okay, so again, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of learning, but uh, 
it's fine i mean if you want to understand it better i suggest you sit down sit down with uh, some there are some really good books uh, i have so in our in our uh, what do you call it um, there are some books that are that are suggested such as askin and weber and all but askin doesn't really contain much of a discussion of group theory so one really good book um uh, it's a little old but it's still very very good because group theory has not really changed right the basic principles of group theory are invariant no pun intended it's a it's a book called group theory of physics of course it contains a lot of and things which uh you don't need unless you you know are working in like field theory or some type of condensed matter or something but if you read the first couple of chapters that is enough to give you a very nice understanding of all of these basic ideas then there are certain orthogonality theorems one of them i have mentioned to you earlier in class the character orthogonal orthogonality then there's a, there is another one which is actually the first of these theorems i'll give you the statement of that just now i won't prove it and then there's something called the regular representation these are topics which you need to understand if you want to know how to find all the irreducible representations of a group and so then after that today i will talk about how we can understand the uh vibrational spectra vibrational spectrum of a group which has dihedral symmetry of a molecule which has dihedral symmetry okay so first let me just mention uh this orthogonality theorem uh, and i'll just write down the the statement of this theorem it goes by the name of the it's called for some reason it's called the great ortho gonality theorem and the statement is the following that for any group you have some set of representation right so we label the irreducible representation of a group g with some index mu and so for instance uh for the dihedral group how many representations we have d1 uh we have two one dimensional representations and one two dimensional representation right so if, if you want you can call them da db and dc you can call it in any i mean you you can label it any way you like so for your representation which is given by this label d mu brackets just to indicate that we are not taking a power of anything the corresponding group representation make uh, is for some element uh is just written in this way right and this is your matrix so it has um it has some matrix elements what are the matrix elements how do we write them well we can um we can write them like this we'll write them as um let's say ij okay so these are the matrix elements of the 
uh, of G in the mute irreducible representation of the group, right? Now, the, this orthogonality theorem is the following statement. This quantity is the order of the group, meaning the number of elements of the group. Okay, so um, this quantity is well defined only if you have a finite group. If you have a continuous group like a Lie group, uh, you will have different. You will have to modify this this uh, this the statement of this theorem because the order of your group is infinite. Then you take for any group element G, you consider the this matrix element for the mute representation. Okay. And you take the complex conjugate of that. And then you consider the matrix element for the for the same group element in the newth right so this index has changed here this is new now in the newth representation and you consider the matrix elements kl okay so what is this this is so you have some group element G. There are two different representations, let's say D mu G and D mu G. And D mu is, let's say, an M dimensional representation, right? So the, it looks like a M by M matrix. And this is an N dimensional matrix n by n dimensional matrix. So here you pick the ith element. Okay, so you take the ith row and the jth column, right? So this is the element that you will label as ij, right? And similarly here you pick the Pick you, so we are picking any element, okay? I'm just, so here we have the KL element, right? And what we do is we multiply these two elements with each other, the blue number with the green number, okay? And then we take a sum over all elements of the group, right? So what, what, what am I doing? For a fixed group element, I'm taking uh, two different representations, right? For those two different representations, I'm multiplying uh, for the for some fixed values of i and j and k and l, I'm multiplying the matrix elements. So I'm keeping i and j fixed and k and l fixed and mu and nu fixed. The only thing I'm changing is the group element g. And the statement is that if I perform this multiplication and then sum over the group element, I get the following expression. Delta mu nu, delta i k, delta j l. So let me, let me just uh, try to write it down a little bit more neatly. Uh, 
a little bit of space here. Okay, so these are the two group elements. So what this is saying is the following. Okay. It is saying that if you consider um, you consider the set of all such matrices. So I take this matrix, okay, for instance. Right, I take this matrix. What is this? This is D mu G. And in this D mu G, I take the matrix elements I, J. Okay. Now, how many such matrices are there, right? How many, how many such matrices are there? Can anybody tell me? For a given group, how many matrices will be there? Vishnu, no? Uh, there will be many representations. No, but I'm keeping the representation fixed. Okay. And I'm keeping the this matrix elements fixed. The only thing I'm changing is the group element, right? So how many such matrices are there? It's the order of the group. Order of the group, right? The number of the number of elements in the group. There will be D mu such matrices. So we can treat each one of these numbers, right? In each matrix, in each matrix for fixed representation and for fixed um, indices, we treat each element, we, we treat each one of these uh, items as an element of a, of a d-dimensional vector, of a d-mu dimensional vector. So V of d-mu, because there are d-mu components where d-mu is the order of the group. Okay, so if you fix mu i j, you get this vector. Now you fix a different representation new, a different set of matrix elements, JNL. Right? For these, you get another, you get a different set of matrices. You get a set of N by N matrices where N is the dimension of this representation. But how many such matrices are there? How many matrices are there? If I fix the representation and the and the group uh, the matrix indices. Priya, how many matrices will be there? Panchami, how many matrices are going to be there? No, I don't know, sir. Okay, so again, 
we fix the group representation and the matrix indices. So there we get two such matrix. Uh, we get d mu such elements, and these d mu elements they form two vectors, right? V and W. And the statement is that if I take V and W, this is equal to zero unless both the representations are the same and the matrix, uh, the matrix indices are the same. Okay. So, so these two vectors are orthogonal to each other, and this is this is very important to understand. So that means I can pick a different group element. I can pick a different sorry, this thing matrix element over here, and a different matrix element here. For each matrix element that I pick, what will I get? I will get a different vector W. For each representation that I pick, I'll get a different vector W. But all such vectors will have how many elements? They will have d mu elements. Because the group has ordered d mu. Well, in this case, for the second, uh, case it is ordered d new right because new is the representation so d new is the order of the group and these two matrices are orthogonal to each other so this is this is a statement this essentially says something like this okay this says that the elements of the group They behave like how how are they behaving? Right, we we have we are taking two matrices, two vectors which are orthogonal to each other, and these uh, what is the label of each of the elements of the vector? The label is labeled by an element of the group, right? So I can write so before. Before I do this, I can do the following. I can take my matrix V and I can write it like this, let's say, okay? V1 times one, zero, zero. V2, zero, one, zero. V of D mu, zero, zero, one, right? So what are these what are these vectors? These are basis vectors, right? These are basis vectors. Right? For a D mu dimensional vector space, these are the basis vectors. And each basis vector. For each basis vector, we can write a single, we can, we can write any vector in terms of these basis vectors, right? So I can write this vector V as follows. I can write it as V of I, oh, sorry, V of I, G of I, I goes from one to D mu. If you remember this notation, this is a this is like a this is like a basis vector in quantum mechanics, right? So each group element is like a basis vector in in this picture. So elements of the group behave like basis vectors of what? Of a order G, order G dimensional 
वेक्टर्स पे एंड अगेन आई मेड अनदर मिस्टेक हियर दिस इज जस्ट this is the same quantity d mu is equal to d nu because we are talking about the same group now we are not talking about the dimension of a representation but the number of elements of the group so instead of calling it d nu or d i should call it something else i will call it n this is the n of the elements number of elements of the group the order of the group v n v elements of the group behave like basis vectors right and in terms of these basis vectors you can write down any given vector so this is this is a statement of this this orthogonality relationship okay and this is called the great orthogonality theorem now there are some consequences of this so we are not going to prove this theorem but we are going to look at some consequences now let's say um that what are the consequences for for the given group in question for g okay let's say there are for every uh, there are n mu irreducible representation of dimension d mu so for example for for the dihedral group right there are two one dimensional representation and one two dimensional representation right so what would we say we would say for this group mu is equal to 1 and 2 the dimensions of the representation so we have mu is equal to 1 and 2 d mu so mu labels the representation d mu gives you the dimension of the representation and n of mu mu tells you that how many are there there are two representations which are of one dimension and one representation of two dimension okay so how many vectors are there right so each vector each vector has has n elements where n is the order of the group but how many vectors are there what is the total number of such vectors shubham how many vectors are there there is a single there is a one vector for each representation for and for each matrix element so if you count all of the representation all of the vectors how many such vectors are there can you do that counting tanuja the is it number of representation times the number of matrix elements times what the number of matrix elements and how many matrix elements are there for the mu representation order of the no this is equal to the sum over all the is that first of all there will be sum over all the reps sum of number of matrix elements multiplied by the degeneracy 
you can call this the degeneracy this n of n of new so the degeneracy is this n of new for a given uh, for a given matrix and a n by n matrix how many how many numbers does are there anand if we, if i give you an n by n matrix how many numbers are there in that matrix n sir so n, n square n square n square right n square so in this case our we have d mu square numbers so this is equal to n summation over mu n mu d mu square this is the total number of vectors right and these vectors are all orthogonal to each other right so this is the important thing to understand that as long as you are in a different representation even if the representation is of the same dimensionality so for instance in the dihedral group remember there are two there is a representation where every element is mapped to one and there is the representation where the rotations are mapped to one and the translations are mapped to minus one both of these representations are of the same dimensionality but the vector associated with with the matrices are orthogonal to each other okay so there this is the number of vectors and all of these vectors are orthogonal to each other now what is the what is the what is the norm of each vector what is the norm of each vector if you look at this expression from this expression can you tell me what will be the length the norm of a say of a vector of a single vector so when i say a single vector what do i mean i mean that mu and nu they are the same right so how do i calculate the norm of any vector if i have some vector what do i mean by the norm i mean sum over all the elements squared right over the number of elements right how many elements are there in this vector let me call this number something else let me call it q right so if you look at this expression and let me copy that expression down here so in this expression these are the components of one vector these are the components of a the second vector right and we are saying that this dot product is zero unless these vectors are the same so if the vectors are the same then what does this expression give us it gives us the following right it gives us norm of v square divided by order of g is equal to 1 over d mu times times 1 right because all the delta functions are one so the norm of the vector is what it's equal to the order of the group divided by by d mu where d mu is the 
representation in which that particular uh, vector lives. Because remember, each vector is associated with what? It is associated with a single, with a fixed representation and with a fixed matrix element. And this quantity d mu here is the dimensionality of that representation. Okay. So the norm of a vector is given by the order of the group divided by the dimensionality of the given representation. Okay. So now let's look at, let's look at, uh, what this is telling us. What is V square? V square is the sum of V I square from I is equal to one to Q for any given representation. And one second, let me just gather my thoughts here. Right. And this is equal to to G divided by all right. So again, here we are fixing we are fixing the representation and the matrix element. So what I'll do is I'll put a little index here to remind me of that fact. I'll put mu i j or mu mu k l instead because i j is taken mu k l is equal to order of the group divided by d mu. Okay, now what this, what this tells us is, um, is the following. That let's say that I take all the elements to be equal to one. All the elements are one. Then what is what is Q first of all? Q is equal to this quantity. The number of representations of a given dimensionality times the number of matrix elements in that dimension. Right? And so what do I get? I sum over all the V, all the V's, all the VI squares. On the left hand side, what do I get? I just get Q. And Q is equal to something like this, G by D mu, which is equal to sum of N mu D mu squared. Right? What does this tell me? This tells me the following, that this quantity, sum of n mu d mu squared over all the possible representations of the group is less than or equal to the order of the group. Because for this particular case, right? This number, this number is a fixed number, Q. It's equal to the order of the group divided by the dimensionality of the representation. the dimensionality of the representation is always some number one or great, greater than one. So this, this expression always has to be less than or equal to G. So, this is the, this is the consequence. Now, this is the first orthogonality theorem, this expression. The second orthogonality theorem is the statement of orthogonality of characters. And we can actually derive this expression from the first theorem. 
So let me write down the expression for the first theorem again. One over the order of the group, summation over all elements in the group, the product of the matrix elements or the fixed representation mu of fixed representation mu and fixed matrix element locations is equal to one divided by the dimension of the representation delta mu nu, delta i k, and delta g l. Now, what is the what is the character of a representation? Rahul, what is the character of of a representation? Siddhant, what is the character of a representation? Kusum. Panchami. Character was something that was invariant, remember? Character of, a, I should say, not of a representation, but character of a given matrix or for a given element. Character of a group element in a given representation of G, right? So what is the what is the representation is d mu g and it's some matrix which is d mu by d mu times what is the character of this matrix trans of the matrix the what trans sum of trace. diagonal elements trace trace, trace trace sorry trace trace right yeah so we'll write it like this this is equal to the trace of d mu g. So now if you look at this expression over here, i, j, and k, l, these are the matrix elements, right? Now, if I take the sum of both of the sides of this expression, if I write down the sum over, uh, so I say that, first of all, I say that i is equal to j, and then I sum over all the elements. And then I say K is equal to L and then I sum over those elements, right? So I'm summing over the diagonal elements. What do I get, right? On the left-hand side, I will get one divided by the order of the group. I'll get the character of this group element in the muth representation multiplied by the character of the same group element in the nuth representation, right? Because I've taken the trace of both of these matrices. I've taken the trace of this matrix and the trace of this matrix. So that gives me the character of the corresponding groups and uh, what will this what will this correspond to so what i'm doing is i'm summing over i is equal to j and over k is equal to l in in this in this expression over here right So what will I get? I will get, um, I will get one. When I sum over all of these these ex, these deltas, I will get one. Well, 
one second let me think for this for a second uh what will i get well i i believe i will get uh, oh and i forgot to take a complex conjugate that's also very important because group elements in general can be complex what you will get is um, d mu when you sum over these delta these chronic delta so on the right hand side you will get one so this says that if i take the the characters of any group and i sum over these vectors i get the order of the group this is the theorem that we have looked at previously right this is the character orthogonality theorem that we looked at in lecture 5 i believe right okay we defined a vector which has which is of dimension n where n is the order of the group and the elements of the vector are the characters of each group element right and so then the statement is that if you take any two such vectors belonging to different uh uh different representation right because each vector depends on the on on some representation on some choice of representation you will get the inner product will give you so i should probably say something of this kind v dot w where w is okay yeah no that that was actually correct yeah so the length of the vector is proportional to the identity and well actually no wi transpose vj is proportional to delta i right so this is the orthogonality of character okay so now there are some consequences of both of these orthogonality theorems and let's look at the most important consequence the most important consequence is how to decompose a given representation into irreducible representation so this i had actually said was an ortho uh, optional topic but i think it's important enough that we should talk about it okay but i think you all have probably on the class coming up so i'll stop here so please uh, read uh section 5.5 um uh, from the group theory notes uh by by shi by shi chen which i have shared with you earlier right okay and uh i i believe uh, one of you sent me a mail asking me for the for the course outline Now the course outline is something that I've shown you before. The course outline is, uh, you know, group theory and special functions and complex analysis. Now, but if you are looking for a lecture by lecture uh, outline, I, I'm afraid I don't have one for you. The reason is because for, first of all, this is the first time I'm teaching this class. and secondly it depends on how fast we make progress as a class on any event topic 
right? So we have spent seven lectures on on on, on groups. I, I know that that may be more than what some other instructors might have done. Uh, but I'm going to take one more class on this. Then we are going to start talking about Lie groups and Lie algebra. Like SU2, SO3, SU3, so on and so forth. And uh, after, again, then the question is how much of that should I cover? There's a vast amount of literature. One can have an year long course on that and still not be done. So I'll spend maybe four or five lectures on that. That's my plan at the time being. And then uh, once that is done, then I will, I will continue with, uh, with special function. And after that, uh, we'll come to complex analysis. The reason I'm saving complex analysis for the end is because you already covered it once in your previous semester. So um, hopefully you won't need you know, too many lectures on that. And then if there are any topics remaining, we will we'll cover them as needed. Okay. There will be one homework assignment, which will be coming up shortly. There will be one quiz, which will be coming up shortly. And you know the usual distribution, right? Apart from that, um, even though I'm not marking your attendance in, uh, on iris it doesn't mean that i am not keeping a record of your attendance i am keeping a record and the reason for that is because uh, well um, i'm supposed to keep a record and also because well tomorrow somebody will might come and complain that uh, they, they got a bad grade and so on and so forth and well I mean, attendance is one measure of the interest that a person shows in a class, right? So today, 16 people are coming, have attended, or 15, I should say 14, because two of these people are me. And uh, what is your class trend? It's like 30, 33. So 19 people are absent, 14 people are attending. So, at the end of the semester, uh, you know, uh, the results will reflect um, your interest in the class and your performance in the class. So, and again, please keep in mind that um, this this last week I was very busy, but now I have some time. And if you have any questions, please me message me on Telegram and tell me. If you would like me to like to have a meeting with me, I can meet with you on Zoom. Okay. Or if you are available on campus, you can meet in my office. But you have to do that. Uh, you have to take that initiative. Okay. All right. So I'll stop it here for today. Bye bye.